Still, the assembled navvies manage to wrest Mega Man from the control of his dark soul and bring him back. Hub Hikari, impressed by the power of your... erm, um, power-type navvy, which easily unlocks Napalm's soul and Tomhawk's soul for use. But also... something else. Because the Dark Ships in Battle Network 5 are actually treated as battleships this time, they can now be sacrificed for use in creating a soul form, which by following the logic of the last game and .exe access, where the soul form is the light that purifies the corruption of Dark Soul, well, this is that corruption coming back and staining that light, simply because you're trying to pull light from the deepest darkness. And in this case, sacrificing a Dark Ship for a double soul instead creates a Chaos Unison. Chaos Unisons are the quote-unquote safe way to use Dark Chips. They're a one-turn use of Double Soul that, by using the Charge Shot, you can then unleash the Sacrifice Dark Chips attack with no HP damage to Mega Man. However, you need to release the attack at a specific frame of the animation for it to succeed. If you don't, then not only does the attack fail, but Mega Man is knocked out of Chaos Unison, and on top of that, his Dark Soul is unleashed for the rest of the turn to run rampant among the enemies you're fighting. It's a high-risk, high-reward, but completely without ways to mitigate the dangers. Well, most of them. Eventually, people found a way to guarantee that the charge shot would go off without backfire. You press the Start button to pause the battle, and check to see what frame the charge shot is on. If it's showing the full charge sphere over Mega Man, you let go of the B button and unpause the game. If it's not, you unpause the game while making sure that the B button is still held down, and then it won't go off prematurely. Then you just repeat until you see the right conditions have been met. However, that requires a complete retraining of muscle memory, just for one thing you might end up screwing yourself out of doing, and not for that much greater an amount of damage than you'd be getting from chaining chips together and doing soul form related damage boosting. Much like everything else related to Dark Souls, I don't touch it. Still, most of the public network has been recovered now, just end areas 4 and 5 being left to liberate. And to that end, your team leader's gone out to recruit an information processing specialist by which to help us out. Rika and Searchman and Team Protoman, and Higsby and Numberman and Team Colonel. Rika is of course still a jerk, but less of an outright asshole as he was in Baldur 4 and his early appearances in Access. Higsby, though is obviously here just to reuse a convenient and thematically appropriate Navi and his double soul form. No complaints, though. Number soul rocks, especially with how easy it is to exploit. And yeah, Higsby decided to help out when asked because he's trying to become more of a man to finally get the courage together to ask Miss Mari out. Which I freaking swear is characterization lifted from the anime, as I cannot remember at any point Higsby in the games having an unrequited crush on her. Regardless, everyone sets out for End Area 4, in hopes our Data Specialist Navi can crack the encryption on the last area. Though before you go, grab the upgrades you couldn't in the last chapter of the game. That extra Navi customizer space is desperately needed at this point. Still, in End Area 4, the Data Navi finds that they can crack the lock, but it'll take some time. And unfortunately, both of them just had something come up. Which works more for Higsby than it does Rika. I mean, let's face it, even with Higsby having other staff members, he's got a popular store to run that requires his time, and the less said about him trying to charm Mari, the better. Rika, though? He's in the military on assignment and placed under the command of Beryl. If Beryl says jump, then the only words out of Rika I'd expect to hear is, HOW HIGH, SIR! Still, with the free day to prepare how they please, Lan and Mega Man remember, hey, they never did find out what Yuri Churro wanted to show them, now did they? Thus, it's time for a trip back to his lab, the only thing of note being a decoded message from the twin's grandfather, Tadashi Hikari. The note itself is... pretty much coded nonsense. The largest clue being to some one or thing named Gao. Taking said note to Haruka as, well, she's the only one left that knew Tadashi, makes us realize... Hey, there's a doghouse in the back of the house. Yeah. That's not the doghouse from the front that's an odd inversion of setting details. That doghouse you see in the window is a completely separate one than the one that acts as the Hikari security system. Which is funny, as they never acknowledge having a dog at any point. And I like how the guidebook, once again, is the snark we all want with this, 
when it's revealed the connecting clue has been written on the doghouse in plain sight for a decade. To quote, How long has that been there? The writing directs us to the air filter computer on Oran Island, once again showing how overused this place is despite how far it is from civilization. As the game explains later, Tadashi was apparently out here a lot working on one thing or another. In this map, you eventually find another clue from a data cluster that directs us to the top of End City's castle, which thus opens up that region and its oddly familiar castle. Said castle also doubles as a transmission system these days for network activity, and even with the liberations going smoothly, it's having some connectivity problems we have to sort out. Though why our new teammate couldn't handle that when they're here is anyone's git. Okay, maybe they were dealing with it and we spooked them. Regardless, at the top of the castle in one of the decorative statue's eyes is a data key that when used at one of the outcroppings in ACDC 3, opens up a secret door to something called a Vision Burst, a digital recording of a moment captured in time. In this case, it's one of the day Lan and Hub were born roughly 11 to 12 years ago. It's here we find a program of Tadashi's dog, Gao, that of the things in the Vision Burst seems to be the only thing that can actually respond to us. Unfortunately, opening the Vision Burst allows Nebula's agents in, requiring us to clear them out of here so they won't catch whatever they're after. Unfortunately, it's revealed from this that your new team member might be a Nebula agent, as they come in to back up the heel navvies we just deleted. But even when I first saw this plot reveal, I didn't buy it for a second. On one side, we know Higsby. He's a complete dork that gives more of a damn about battle chips than world conquest, as the evil Mwahahahang has nothing to do with those collectibles and Higsby in the last game was the one to warn us about the dangers of dark ships. It is not plausible for him. Rika being a strict military type also doesn't fit the MO for someone doing a secret infiltration mission. I mean, it has been done in fiction where such is all an act, but that's kind of the downside of doing this with someone we've formed a double soul with before. We already know their character. Still, we've got to report this to our team leader, and frustratingly they shug off the concern, not even raising the point that we do know these people personally to calm us down. But such is addressed the next day, when mass network interruptions start appearing, originating from End Town's castle, requiring us to enter the transmission system at the top of the building that's already had its security traps tripped. And that's both in that network, and outside it. And while putting together the costume of a samurai on the digital model is an understandable barrier puzzle, especially as there's upgrade items in those computers where those parts are stored, I say without hyperbole that the kendo battle challenge the security system here forces you into is the second most aggravating minigame the games have put in them. Only topped by Kendo Man's battle challenges in Battle Network 4. Ironic that both times I consider a minigame the worst, it involves swordplay. At the very least, the reason I hate Kendo Man's minigame is because the damn thing is so consistently broken in Battle Network 4. Here, it's just because it's an extremely difficult challenge. What you've got to do is hit 100 of these security drones without letting Lan get hit himself. First, it starts out easy, but over time the drones just start coming at you faster meaning you more and more have to swing at a pace that can knock you off your tempo, leading to missed strikes. And if you miss the strike at the worst time, it's game over and you need to start it all over again. It is a massive time sink if you've not got the timing down, which is actually made worse by the DS version, because the Nintendo DS's D-pad is recessed into the console as opposed to the plus mark being raised. So you need to press harder and be faster on the inputs to actually get it to respond in time due to the different board type the buttons are laid with. Compared to that, the Gargoyle Computer Security System at the top of the castle is a cakewalk, this area having you track down ninja programs amidst the region and bring them to their thematically matching traps, while avoiding being followed by the wrong types of ninja. I mean, there's so many wrong types of ninja out there that such a task in and of itself is difficult. Seriously, why is it the grand majority of media featuring ninja are complete trash fires? Getting the right ninja to stay with you usually means doubling back, as they stay in the space their swap occurred in, though that becomes more difficult over time as the chains of ninja programs you have to bring to unlock each trap gets longer. 
Honestly, I like doing this one, as it's an intelligently mapped exploratory quest requiring you to think of how you travel through the area to get to your goal. Help that this is the area where you can get Moonblade and Katana battleships, which can both end up being dead useful. At the end of all the traps at the main console for the transmission system, we find our brain-type Navi, the real one. The previous encounter we had with them as a Nebula agent was in fact an imposter, a fact revealed to us after we fight them. With said navvies also being interested in engaging us, because there's also a fake Mega Man around storing up trouble by making others think he's still consumed by Dark Soul. <laughs> Again, no, we will be getting to him later if I can actually continue the anime reviews. Once more, as Searchman and Numberman are navvies we fought before, and they have the same techniques and tricks from those encounters. So there's no real point detailing over again what they can do. Either way around, they're easy battles with what's available. Though with his fewer hit points, Numberman of course goes down easier, leading to the navvies engaging their doppelgangers and quickly eliminating them, restoring the network, and building the camaraderie needed to move on to the fifth liberation mission. As I detailed earlier, this is the one you want to repeat for the purpose of rating it for resources. Both Number Man and Search Man's respective number check and panel search abilities are fantastic for getting items out of panels fast and efficiently. With Search Man, panel search liberates all panels with an item stored within them that are in a straight line, which combos amazingly with the use of Gyro Man or Shadow Man to open up deep paths behind enemy lines. With Numbermans, it in fact removes the entire need to liberate those panels, albeit the area of search is limited to a 2x3 rectangle, meaning there are certain layouts where that just won't work. In specific, the set of panels on the left side of the map that have a paralysis trap right in front of them. Regardless of what else you do, that panel needs to be removed, so Numberman can search the remaining three panels for the barrier key and the items inside, which allows you into the rest of the map. Whereas, if you use Searchman for the task, he blows up the trap and gets the bearer key in one fight. And then you have the option of sending your speed navi over to liberate the panels with the items, or just skipping them. The difficulty of the map, though, comes from where the second of the three bearer keys is situated, right in front of the dark void of the map, Cosmo Man. Due to its placement, whatever navi you use to liberate those panels is going to be stuck directly in his range of attack unless you liberate the panel to the farthest south of him with one navi, and then one turn liberate the remaining three immediately to the north, so the navvies are literally one square outside of his attack range when getting that barrier key. This opens up the larger top left board, where the final barrier key is hidden alongside the final two dark holes. Another reason I recommend grinding this mission, though, is Cosmo Man himself. He is the strongest dark lord and thus his mechanics make him a pain. Thus it pays to train yourself against him now, so his more difficult version does not trip you up later. He summons large ringed satellites to charge across the map, which you can't destroy, and have large radiuses that require a lot of dodging. Or alternatively, the use of invisible and anti-damage chips. Those satellites are the worst, as they block Cosmo Man from attack and it's very rare he comes within close combat distance to strike him with swords. The best way to deal with him, since he likes to hug the back row, is to hit him from behind with Lance Chips double charged by Tomahawk Soul, or alternatively use Shadow Soul to charge a sword chip to backstab him. As those are both kernel exclusive strategies, though striking with a lance still does work regardless, an alternative for Proto Man players is to rely on the Tornado Battle Chip and Gyro Soul in general, with both its charge shot and the chip getting around whatever he tries to blitz you with. With Cosmo Man defeated, the main network is finally cleared from Nebula Control, and this entire event with the imposters has built a better rapport with the Brain Navi and Operator, giving up search and number souls, allowing the player to more easily seek out better chips to combo together depending on their folder builds. However, Land's odd activities all throughout the Nebula Crisis has caused his friends to finally confront him about what he's doing and thus the secret of the Anti-Nebula team is out. But this is something they really should have not done in public, where others could overhear them. Which thus leads DNN reporter Ribita, another veteran of Battle Network 2, and medicine maker Jasmine to both overhear the conversation, 
and believe Lan might know the way for them to get into the Underdads. I mean, he and Mega Man are the kings of it, so... And once again, there's a pretty steep difference in execution between the versions. Rabita, as an investigative reporter and presenter for the network, is looking to, well, save her own career by finally cracking the story about the secrets of Nebula and how they became such a huge threat. Moreover, she's asking nicely, almost begging Lan to help her. But due to Lan's deeper awareness of the full situation, knows it's just too dangerous. But because Lan is a kid, well, the dynamic falls into the standard child-adult interactive relationship and the adult doesn't listen to the kid, who actually by experience knows better. Because of course, an adult should be able to handle a situation better than a kid would. Rabita's need and desperation to find a way to save her career is understandable motivation, and her detachment from the depths of her battle makes it more reasonable why she would then do what she does. Jasmine, however, does not have those defenses! Now, Jasmine is looking for a secret medical book that is hidden there, and doesn't care about the cost of going as long as she obtains it. She is not under a time limit that requires her reject common sense and advice of others in a panic as Rabita is. At worst, she's trying to rush to find a cure for her sick grandfather. But the man is not on death's door to excuse the urgency of her request, or how rude she comes off as in demanding the means to access the region, before impulsively just going, screw it, I'll find my own way in. In both cases, the requests are certainly ones that would be reasonable to ask for escort into the region, especially from its king. But with Nebula still maintaining control of it, it isn't the right time for such for Jasmine to try and find that book. Rabita, once more, makes sense. Nebula's activities are the entire reason she wants down in there, while Jasmine could just wait until the region is liberated, but refuses to. Before reporting this to the team leader, take a detour once more to Oran. You'll find a Nebula agent that defected from the organization there, and from him you'll get a Nebula ID card that'll unlock all the barricaded mystery data throughout the network. A helpful bonus, as when talking to the leader, it's revealed that Nebula might be after what's hidden within the vision bursts, as Regal has been searching for something called the Hikari Report that is key to his ultimate plans. Thus, we have to head back to the Vision Burst, only for the digital recreation of Gao to be absent from it, once more showing the oddity of it. Additionally, we've got to return to Haruka to get any clue about the dog, her pulling out an old pic of Tadashi and Gao, which shows them covered in dirt and mud. But where could they possibly have been spelunking? Why, the only area open to do that in this game is Oran. You see what I mean that setting Oran on an island two hours off the coast more and more becomes a narrative complication? Once there, we find a new man out in front of the mine, who tells us the old navi we got the mine key from before also has a security block passcode that leads to another navi, who has a key to another vision burst, which is located inside the fourth drill computer, requiring us to once more travel the long trip down into the depths of the mines to get there. This time, the vision burst is of Oran 25 years ago, when mining of the original Magnum Metal Thane was first plumbed. Unfortunately, Gao is here, and after a bit, ends up captured by Blizzard Man, who has been resurrected by the dark power of the Dark Nebula. And he's not the only one. For as Blizzard Man gets away with Gao, we're informed that Scilab is under attack by Shade Man specifically destroyed the Mission Control Center the team's leader used up until now. This forces an evacuation of the anti-Nebula forces, land charged with finding a replacement home base, though this ends up being a bit silly in Team Colonel, as their new base is situated in Higsby's storage room, which is set up to double as an office, and Higsby could have just outright offered for them to use it, since in that version of the game, he's already part of the team but the necessity to move their operations has since distracted the team from maintaining the security of the network elsewhere, and Toadman or Medi has made their move from the Underdeads, going to try and break open the dark firewall, isolating it off. And this is again why I consider Jasmine worse than Rabita on this, as Jasmine in this event acts like a complete brat and can't stop insulting us for trying to stop them from doing something stupid! Rabita, once more by comparison, actually does acknowledge that. Lan's trying to do the right thing, but her desperation is driving her forwards even in spite of the dangers. 
And those dangers make themselves evident from the revived Cloud Man coming to attack us, and then be brought down by the respective leader navvies. But even then, that doesn't instantly delete them. Cloud Man pulling off a kamikaze attack that appears to delete the leader navvies. This demoralizes the assembled forces. After all, the leader navvies held their positions for a reason. They have a track record of success. Len and Mega Man have saved the world on at minimum five separate occasions. Why is this so easily forgotten? Well, in this case, it's actually not. Sean and Beryl promoting Lan into the position they held as team leader as... Hell, he's the operations head anyways and takes over during liberation missions as it is. By this point, they have the experience needed to do the job. But Lan, once more showing the humility that's generally absent from improper depiction of the character, isn't sure he's right for the job. Up until this point, he's primarily been responsible only for the tasks of himself and Mega Man, or is working in tandem with seniors that take the weight of duty off him. Now, he's going to be solely responsible for others under him, and considering his own shortcomings in the past, well, with the stakes they're up against, with all the Dark Lloyds they defeated coming back, there's a legitimate tension revolving around the question of whether they can win now, with them spearheading the fight. Which is then where the support navvies and operator come in, once more attempting to dive deep into the undernets. However, why they're doing this has changed wanting to wake Lan up to the reality that he can lead them into battle, by charging in after us and through the perils of the Undernet to help save someone else. While Jasmine in this is far more of a brat, Rabita by comparison... Well, she's followed Lan's story throughout the last couple years of him saving the world. She knows that he's as capable as any adult that'd be doing this despite his young age. So it's time that he believes in the people that believe in him, thus leading into a fight with the support navvies. Toadman has had his mechanics changed a bit since his time in Battle Network 2, but like the other returning navvies, retains most of his tricks, helped in this case by Rubita giving him C panels to hide himself in. The downside for him, though, is the L chip code possesses the Elect Real chip, which is a very powerful Elect Element chip that when it makes contact with the C panels, it electrifies all of them for massive damage, including against enemies hiding inside them. This thus makes the fight much easier than it could have been, and comparatively not as much of a pain as they were in Battle Number 2. Medi, however, as is my recurring thing, is useless. Their only notable capability is to throw status effect inducing pill bombs at Mega Man, which are all easily dodged. The worst being a healing bomb that steals HP, but that's so rarely used, I don't ever see it. Still, the point has been made, and the support navvy is joining the team to help liberate the last public region of the net. And it's needed. For not only does the internet liberation map have a lot of panels and a drought of order points, well, its big boss is either Dark Proto Man, or a reprogrammed colonel. Admittedly, at least, you'll know how they'll fight, but that's a bit annoying to make them the last Liberation boss before the post-game maps. The key to blitzing through this map is thus on Toadman and Medi's abilities. As I discussed earlier, Toadman's life melody can allow another navvy such as Shadow Man to liberate a five-row-long set of panels. Medi's in turn is Twin Liberation, where if, after she sets up a liberation, another navvy like Gyro Man can go to the opposite end of where Medi set such up, and that other navvy succeeds on their end of the Twin Liberation, then the entire length of panels is simultaneously liberated. When used correctly, both of these methods massively reduce the number of order points needed to penetrate into enemy lines. Though both methods will rely on you having mastered fighting liberation battles, with viruses spawning on both sides of you, to really take full advantage of their circumstances. Especially as the barrier keys this time are not always easy to access if the speed navvy is always occupied as a required party in the extended liberation lines. Even then, Medi is only so useful in this. It often being just a safe bet for Protoman players to just focus more on Napalm Man's liberations as they open up shorter but more reliable paths. Couple once more with Medi's notorious weak health and useless charge shot in comparison to Toad Man actually having a defensive strat that works with an L cold folder and an actually useful charge shot, and you can understand why I actively avoid using her. Sadly, we don't recover our leader navvy from Dark Mind Infestation as easily as Mega Man was recovered, 
Proto Man and Colonel running off. But Mega Man at least getting the useless Medi Soul and useful Toad Soul out of it, leaving just one more soul form to recover. Unfortunately, Regal succeeded in getting what he wanted from Gao and Yuichiro's other available information, setting in motion the completion of what the manufacturer of Dark Chips was all about. Soul Nets. A network system by which the true malice of humanity that is hidden beneath the mask of pleasantry can be exposed to the world. And in that chaos, he would rule. Hey, dude, if you have to use a network system to mess with people's brainwaves to act against how they normally would choose to, then that's not exactly exposing the truth of things. That's inflicting upon them your own perception of the world, which for them would thus be a lie. Hell, if that malice is their default state, then they wouldn't even be affected by the system at all. The differences between someone being kind and empathetic, or being cruel, selfish, malicious, and sociopathic, is often a simple choice. Remove that choice, and you take away something that makes them human. It does not expose the truth of humanity, it abandons it. Fortunately, Lan and Mega Man are immune, and it's thanks to an amulet that contains magno metal in it that they were given earlier, as it screws with the field that Regal's soul net is generating. But fortunately, this is the test version, transmitted via microservers with the program planted in various areas, with the hunt to shut them all down, starting in a fake tree in ACDC, which contains your version's brain nappy. Yeah, all of your team members have been affected by this, requiring you to defeat them all once again before you can break the freaking things. This hunt also requiring hunts to tourism kiosks at Scilab's entrance, the netball computer back on the Queen Bohemia, the Gargoyle Computer's main control system, and ultimately the last one found back in the depths of the Undernets, and guarded once more by Proto Man or Colonel, with it taking interference from your support navi to permit them to be purified of Dark Soul influence, which thus releases Proto Soul and Colonel Soul into Mega Man's possession. The Soulnet servers have, as consequence of their use, helped the officials track down where Regal's true base is. So once the leader navi's recovered, we'll be in good shape to stop them. But before that, however, the repeated inquiries into Dadashi's actions have led Haruka to find an old data disk of the Hikari Patriarchs, which leads Lan and Mega Man to one final vision burst in Scilab, which reveals a far younger Dadashi Hikari and Albert Wiley, who are shown working to develop a primordial version of the Soul Net long ago, before their ultimate falling out that led Wiley down the wrong path. The Soul Net, as explained, wasn't supposed to be used in the way Regal is using it. It was meant to be a means by which to allow people's souls to bridge connections between them for better understanding. Something Yuichiro took a different way than they did with his development of NetNavi technology to provide companionship that helped people interact in good faith without some invasive system exposing their deepest selves without consent. Tadashi Hikari, a scientist of questionable morality. Still, the echoes of past people are a bit more aware, with this echo of Tadashi telling his grandsons that the future is theirs to grasp and yada yada yada, you've heard this speech before. The next day, it's finally time to assault Regal's stronghold. It revealed to be near the top of Mount Bellinus, which is a fictional mountain, but it apparently has some geothermal activity as the facility is drawing that kind of energy to run it, this being the key production plant of dark chips the world over. Your speed navi's operator will infiltrate the place ahead of everyone else, giving the rust a map by which to speed up infiltration. But eventually, everyone will run into roadblocks that can only be resolved by jacking into the control machines of the facility, and requiring you trade use of each team navi to get around similar obstacles that conveniently align with their specializations. Though it can take a bit of trial and error to figure out how to advance everyone around the puzzles in turn to their respective gate switches, that allowed the other team members to pass to their next set of switches and gates. Once more, not helped that each of the chief Dark Lloyds are the guards of this place, requiring another fight with each of them that only succeeds in the whittling down of the team's navvies, as they're swallowed by portals to that dark galaxy, wherein all dark power resides. And after facing all four chiefs one last time, you can move into the final confrontation with their boss, Nebula. Gray. But before that, let's skip ahead to once more talk about the post-game goals. 
First off, you're going to have a much easier time revisiting the Undernet from now on, as there's an easy access point made available in the Dark Chip Factory to get over here. Second, it is only now that you can encounter the Ghost Navi data of the Dark Void Generals. The reason for this is before this point, each of the Dark Void's data was being harvested and reconstituted by Nebula Grey and the Dark Galaxy, thus explaining how you could fight them in the Factory again. But once they're deleted in the Dark Void Factory, now those ghost datas are set free on the net. But you'll need to S-rank their random encounter ghosts alongside doing the same with all the teammate navvies to eventually pass the last obstacles. Second, you should have been able to do it by now, especially with the collection advantages the game gives you, to pick up 100 standard chips. Once you do, you'll be able to talk to a gold-colored Mr. Program in the internet, who will open up a gate to the nebula areas, and as a consequence release onto the net higher-tiered versions of the viruses you have fought before, which in turn have on them higher-tiered versions of their respective battle chips for use in upgrading your battle chip folder and further completing your collection of them. I vastly prefer this to what Battle Network 4 did with New Game Plus, and New Game Plus Plus. It evokes a retread of the same network areas again, yes, but it's not making it so it's such is isolated off until you complete every story event again. And if you don't want to do it, then you don't have to do it as the base game can be finished without doing it. Moreover, if you find out you still need to collect some of the lower tier chips later on to complete your library, you can have the Mr. Program close the hole back up again, and the viruses will all revert to their weaker states. This was, of course, one of the most disastrous things about Battle Network 4 too. Once you started your new game plus, there was no going back to battle the lower tiered virus variants if you missed a chip, even making worse the collection play experience in the long run if you had to start the game all over, not because it was bugged up, but because you missed something. But if you are ready to dive deeper, well, you're going to have to complete the 7th Liberation mission, headed once more by Shade Man. And if you can complete this mission in 10 turns, you get the Blackwing Mega Chip. Unfortunately, this map lacks availability of both the speed and support navvies, so you're going to be heavily reliant on proper use of Napalm Man and Tomahawk Man's abilities alongside trying to score one-turn liberations to advance to the Dark Holes and Barricade's locations. It's not required for every Navi in every turn, just the first few so as to give you enough wiggle room by which to get the chance to end things on turn 10. Even if you don't succeed at turn 10 though, it's not the worst thing, as Nebula Area 2 has a net dealer that sells the Blackwing Megachip themselves, but for 28,000 zenny. And to not pay that expense? Oh my yes, you'll want to replay the map once you get better chips if you don't succeed the first time around. Nebula 2 is just a bunch of teleporter puzzles that's a decent breather between liberation missions. But Nebula 3 has the second to last liberation mission to it. Your speed navvy's back and drag your support navvy with them for this, so you can blitz through the mass destruction of panels and lines here. And it's needed as Mission 8 likes to corral how you move in specific ways, thanks to certain squares being blocked with barrier panels to prevent easy passing, but not in a way that completely blocks the path off. It is frustratingly easy, if you are doing things wrong, for the mid-boss enemies to block those off themselves, thus placing a barricade against the speed navvies getting behind enemy lines, or getting to the panels that hide or spare order points that power your power and support navvies' special abilities, and not help that one of the dark holes is just surrounded by paralysis traps that will lock up any navvies approaching and liberating it, which only further delays your progress by what heavy hitters you do have trying to progress further. Still, if you manage to shut Cloudman down in 12 turns, you'll get the Muramasa Mega Chip from it. At the end of Nebula 3 is another Gold Mr. Program, which requires you have most of the Tier 2 standard chips having been picked up on top of the Tier 1s. This portal does the same as the last one and upgrades all the viruses into the Tier 3s thus allowing you to grab what standard chips you haven't yet to complete that entirely. But before you go to do that, you'll want to check out the challenges in Nebula 4. For Nebula 4 is a combination of great and frustrating, as if you completed various elements of the game's collections, it'll unlock barriers to a variety of rewards, including both Mega and Giga chips you shouldn't have yet. The tedium of it is one of those gates requires you to track down 5 heal navvies that have now spawned in the previous parts of the net, but will only show up if you observe the barrier tied to their challenge. Thus, so you don't have to travel back here an unnecessary trip to spawn them, it's better to come here before logging out to hunt down the Tier 3 battleships, so you only need to traverse the networks hunting them down 
one more time instead of twice. Once you're past this room, you should only be missing a couple chips before you've got everything, among them being the Anubis A from the Final Liberation mission. I already went over Mission 9 earlier, so I don't feel a need to further elaborate, but just go through it slow. And if need be, abuse the fact that both your Leader Navi and Support Navi allow you two saves per turn on this map to save scum your way around setbacks. Even with the shortcut I detailed earlier, this map is still a pain with how strong the viruses, mid-bosses, and dark voids are. But get past them, and you'll finally be at Nebula Area 6, where you need to face off once more with the Dark Souls of your team's navvies, and regardless of how well you do against them, as long as you'll win, you'll be allowed into the second battle against Nebula Grey. Log out and come all the way back through, and you can now face the true King of Chaos. I'll bait with a bit of a caveat. When you return to face the Dark Soul Navvies this time, you're on a time limit within which you have to beat them. Take more than three minutes total to delete all six Dark Souls, and you'll just face Nebula Grey again. Do so in two minutes or less, and you'll have to fight Mega Man's strongest Dark Soul. But do so in more than two minutes and less than three, and you'll encounter Base as the true King of Chaos, who when you beat him, will give up his Giga Chip. Return here after that and Base Omega will become a random encounter in Nebula 6, and that encounter will be upgraded in turn, purportedly, to Base XX in Twin Leaders, as long as you're in Base Cross, to face the strongest base you'll ever be expected to encounter in the franchise. Unfortunately, yeah, a lot of this part of the game is a bit impossible to be done. I mean, it can be, and I did it years ago on the GBA cartridge to unlock easier play through Twin Leaders, but man, will it take you a while to do, even with the best battleship folders ironed out. Which brings us back to our confrontation with Regal and his perfect incarnation of darkness that is Nebula Grey. Regal activating the true soul net to connect the minds and emotions of everyone. And with Nebula Grey installed on the soul net server, it will put everyone under his spell and grow the power of darkness beyond all limits. This was the true end product of Dark Chick development, to perfect the ultimate Dark Soul embodying the truth of human malice in digitized form, and through that corruption, gain control over the entire human race. Mega Man and Lan are left alone to stop them. The others afflicted by the soul nets, but immediately after jacking in, the Darkloids come back from dark space to attack them. However, if they can come back from there, so can every other Navi swallowed by it. The team members plus Roll, Gutsman, and Glide holding off the Darkloids so Mega Man himself can confront the end boss. The representation of humanity's digitalized evil. Yeah, I'm betting Regal doesn't know that Hub Hikari is a digitalized human himself. Nebula Grey is once more among the harder end bosses of the Battle Network games, and for the same reason as Duo. He has no battlefield on his side to exploit. Worst, his body is not his actual body, but a manifestation of malice itself. The true core you want to hit is the blue glowing wisp which constantly orbits Nebula Grey. Which is, of course, the difficulty, as you're constantly splitting your attention between Grey's attacks and where the Wisp is. Some of your chips, despite the lack of a board, can still hit the Wisp if it's in the right spot. In particular, Lance can work at the right times. But part of the reason I avoid Cactus Ball from my L folder is it doesn't work here. Made worse in that you can't steal the panels in front of him. So most sword chips, short of casting Life Sword, aren't going to work. Fortunately, Lord of Chaos and Twin Leaders are huge damage boosts against him, and could put things back on even footing. Facing the stronger variations, you're going to want to rely a lot on damage doubling, but that's not easy for Tomahawk or Told Souls due to Grey's propensity to break the panels. But even when you win, Nebula Grey can use his own dark power to restore himself, attempting to consume Mega Man outright. Problem is... Dark Soul is a digital copy of the malice of a human soul. Well, as I said, Hub Hikari is a true digitalized human, and thus he has the power of choice the Dark Soul is denied. The power of the soul net amplifying the power of his own soul, which allows him to truly incarnate inside the net. This incarnation suppresses Grey's Dark Soul, wrecking it enough for the others to intervene, 
enabling Mega Man to overcharge his charge shot to blow Nebula Grey away. This causes an overload in Regal's soul net, setting off the entire facility's self-destruct, somehow. Everyone evacuating the building, bar Beryl. Beryl actually has a history with Regal, or specifically Regal's father, Wily. Beryl having been asked by Wily to stop his son's mad scheme, as even Wily understood that people's souls and free will are not to be messed with and should not be slave to anything. The soul net is merely a means by which to connect between generations, one that is intended to build a better future, even if you have to tear down what you view as a broken one to do it. Which resultantly gives us our cameo of Dr. Wily for the game to show that, yeah, he is not dead from the events of Battle Network 3, intervening on his son's idiocy to stop his corruption of humanity via Dark Souls for good, consequently giving him a chance to start over by using what's left of the soul net to purge from Regal the malice he had wrapped himself in the past ten years, which was Wily's own fault when he'd believed he died. It thus allows Regal a second chance to live his life without the shadow of Wily's legacy hanging over him. Thus Regal can work towards his own redemption in his own time without the specter of dark chips hanging over everyone. The game ending with Lan and his group of friends finally getting a chance to see the vision burst Yuichiro had discovered that set this entire adventure off. Battle Network 5, to wrap all this back up, is another of the good Battle Network games, and does a lot better with its handling of Nebula than the predecessor game did. A lot of the problem of it, though, is Regal is not as much a focused on antagonist as Wily was in the early games primarily because each chapter of the story doesn't regularly have intercuts to him and his plans as, say, the chapter structure of the earlier games did. While you can still feel the consequences of his schemes, it says it stays more firmly focused on Lan and Mega Man's perspective throughout, alongside exploration of the recruits and their related subjects. This also shows why the back half of the Battle Network games struggled, in that they lacked meaningful character stories that are made to matter to the overall plot. In Four's case, every character story was only relevant to the tournament and the acquisition of soul forms, but mattered nothing to the larger crisis narrative about Duo's coming calamity, and few of those tales in any way tied themselves to the Nebula Crisis, which also was not being addressed. While Nebula stays the focus by comparison in Five, it's often felt in the abstract. Without operators for the main boss Darkloids, it likewise feels as if they weren't given much chance for character, and thus we still don't see the scope of them and their power, whereas World 3 and by proxy Gospel, we met their operators, we interacted with their operators in the games, and their interaction with their navvies in turn gave them character. This is something, as I've explained before, is better handled in the anime, particularly with Miss Yuri acting as the point agent for Regal while he himself was busy with his research and the focus on the Dark Lloyd navvies allowed them to retain more distinct personality and actions that would then need to be thwarted. Whereas here, the Dark Lloyds we see are just different flavors of malice. And you know what? Fair enough. Sometimes you need to have someone that is recognized as transparently evil to be able to know the signs of when one is capable of being redeemed. It's, th it's that cartoonish stereotype that allows us to see how someone that is nothing but evil can exist so we can then be on guard for the different degrees of sociopathic malice in reality. But the problem over time is there's a lack of understanding that evil can be born as easily as from an overabundance of apathy, or a lack of empathy for others, that cuts someone off and isolates someone from others that are not like them to put them against the world, or using others to gain their own advantages, a selfishness and self-interest that inflicts themselves on others, and goes out of one's way to hinder others just to benefit oneself. To not think of others or consider them worthy of having rights, choice, and freedom, all to deliberately deny them, all to deliberately deny them the capacity to obtain a happy life. Sometimes evil is as simple as a values dissonance, not liking the choices others make, thus working to deny those others all choices which are then made for them, but not in a beneficial way. This nuance is often lost as, how do you present that? 
How do you show that evil can be born from the abuse of beneficial systems? Of hoarding things that are supposed to be used by everyone until the point that no one can have them anymore because there's not enough to go around. That taking the easy path to a solution can harm people years into the future because in the moment those didn't see the harm. And years later they still refuse to acknowledge that they were wrong, thus kept making victims. These are not simple concepts to represent in a story about fighting the darkness in one's heart. And in this way, this is one aspect where Balnorok 4 could claim some superiority in presenting varying forms of malice born from selfishness. If it weren't for how those with malice in them were constantly presented as idiots as opposed to the true, informed sociopathy the most evil people in our real world are shown to possess. I'm not faulting Battlework 5 for not going farther into this. This was clearly not what the game ever was going to do, and the games are more focused on the teams and team dynamics in play. But to this day, I can't help but feel it's lacking something more it could be in contrasting these sides and the darkness they've come together to fight against. Maybe it's supposed to be a subtextual theme, especially since so much of the team members are made up of former World 3 and gospel agents where reform is possible for those who did bad things because of bad decisions. But what is certain is this game is more buoyed up by its exclusive gameplay mechanics than anything. At the very least, however, in this dynamic of a story of empathy versus malice, they didn't botch the presentation of that conflict as much as Battle Number 4 did, and that's because it remembered to stay on point to that story. I will hope to release videos on Axis and Stream before we swing back to Battle Network 6, as both series do more expand on the core conflict Battleworks 4 and 5 made the core basis of the conflicts in their story, and in my opinion, to their overall improvements. But until then, thank you for watching. I'm Deshinta, and I'll see you next time.